Boy means nothing to me. Oh, I can't stand the wailing of women. One word and I hit you again. I'm telling mother. What's going on, everybody? My name's Cliff, and this is another episode of Unpack That Bowl, the show where we take a deep dive in the pop culture. So, uh, Game of Thrones is going to end pretty unsatisfyingly, and I'm making this video ahead of time because I have a feeling the ending is going to be very unsatisfying. Alright, this is Future Cliff interjecting here. I just got to let you know, yes, I watched the episode. I watched the season series finale of Game of Thrones, and trust me, I'm going to talk about it. But I thought about it, and I have mold over it, and I decided I'm going to sit on it for a day or two and re-watch the episode and then I'll talk about it. So, let's get back to this video. So, today we're gonna take a deep dive into some of the most satisfying moments in Game of Thrones. Jon Snow kills the mutineers at Craster's, avenging Jorah Mormont's death. Having killed Jorah Mormont in the mutiny at Craster's Keep, Carl Tanner made himself an enemy of the Night's Watch and Jon Snow. To avenge their Lord Commander, Jon Snow and a small group of Night Watch brothers venture north beyond the wall and attack the group. Although Carl has the upper hand at first because of the dirty tactics and fighting style, Jon eventually earns the upper hand when one of Craster's daughters, who Carl and the other mutineers raped and abused, stabs him in the back. While he's distracted by her, Jon stabs Carl through the skull with Long Claw, the Valyrian steel blade that Jor Mormont gifted Jon for saving his life a year prior. Getting to see John stab that nigga in the face after how ballsy and arrogant this nigga was being, so satisfying. Daenerys takes the Kalasar. This shit was crazy, everything up the flames, right? Having been captured by the Kalasar in the last episode of season 5, John Daenerys Targaryen was taken back to Vastothrak, he is the where her fate wolf. was to be decided by the many the cows who had gathered the there. When she was brought before the cows, they began discussing what they would do to her, including taking turns raping her and giving her to the masters of Yunkai. She, talking in fluent Dothraki, told them about the promises Khal Drago made her the last time she was there. They mocked her, but she told them that they were small men who were not fit to lead Dothraki people, but she was. They told her that they would definitely rape her as well as let their blood riders do so as well, but she merely smiled and placed her hands on the fire pits. She told them that they would not serve her, but they would die, before pushing all the pits over and causing the temple to become engulfed in flames. As she stepped out of the burning temple unharmed, the Dothraki bowed to their new leader. And I thought this moment was really satisfying because we get Grey Worm, we get Dario, and we get Jorah, and they all see Danny's power, and they've been following her for a while, and only Jorah has actually seen her step out of the flame, so for Dario, Jorah's like, <laughs> This is what you get yourself into. John gets named King of the North. In the Great Halls of Winterfell, the Northern Lords discuss what to do for the upcoming winter and the White Walkers that come with it. They appear to dismiss Jon Snow's warning and say that they wish to return to their own castles. But Lyanna Mormont, the Lady of Bear Island and Jorah's cousin, stands up and addresses several lords who were directly affected by the Boltons who John had just defeated and liberated the North from. She states that she and House Mormont have always remained loyal, and that the only person that they would address as king is a Stark, who, despite not having their name, John is. The other wards apologize for not committing to his cause at first and beginning to pledge their loyalty. The entire hall, even the wildlings and knights of the Vale, raise their swords and declare him King of the North. We know no king, but the king in the North whose name is Stark. I don't care if he's a bastard. Ned Stark's blood runs through his veins. He's my king from this day until his last day. And I will stand behind Jon Snow. The king in the north! The 
This scene holds a special place in my heart because it allowed the audio to be used for a Patriot type of video, the King in the North. And it, 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 un, related to Game of Thrones, it really is satisfying because we get Jon being embraced as not only a Stark, but King Stark. And it's embraced by someone that shares his mother's name, even if he doesn't know it. It's, come on, so satisfying. Viserys getting his crown. Spiteful and cruel, the Beggar King, Viserys Targaryen, violently abuses his younger sister, Daenerys Targaryen, and threatens her if she should not comply with him in episode one of season one. And I'm reading the books right now, and I will say that the books make Viserion a lot more sympathetic of a character. Because Loki, I feel him, he was ripped away from King's Landing when he was there. Like, he got to witness being noble, and now they're on the run. <laughs> So not what he did was right, because he's a shithead, but it did make him more sympathetic. His cruelty becomes even more apparent when he sold her as a bride to a frightening Dothraki warlord named Drogo, in exchange for an army, especially when she begged him not to, and he told her that his claim to the throne would include letting Kalazar and all 40,000 of his men and their horses rape her if they wanted. Also, he could have the throne. When his sister begins to break free of his control, he tries to beat her while she's pregnant, and although he didn't know that at the time, she hit him in the head. Which in hindsight, it really did act as foreshadowing because she hit him with a golden belt, but whatever. That was her first defiant act against Viserys. After having drunk excessively, Viserys stumbles into Khal Drogo's hut, and he shouts about wanting his crown. I want what I came for. I want the crown he promised me. He bought you. But he never paid for you. Tell him I want what was bargained for, or I'm taking you back. He can keep the baby. I'll cut it out and leave it for him. When he was told his place is back with the common Dothraki people, he threatened the lives of Daenerys and her unborn child. <sighs> Bad. Bad move. Bad move, Viserys. Nigga, you so. Okay, let's see where this goes. Khal Drogo has him restrained, and he has his arms broken first, which is crazy, but then he melts a bunch of gold in a pot. Daenerys looked on as her husband poured molten gold over her abusive brother's head, and watched emotionally as he fell to the ground with a chilling clank. And this was especially satisfying too, because Jorah was like, Danny, you can look away, you don't have to see this. And she was like, nah, I'm finna see how this is about to go down. And Drogo says his first English word and goes, a crown fit for a king. Like, okay. Tywin getting murked on the shitter. It's season four of Game of Thrones. Tyrion Lannister having been accused of the murder of King Joffrey and having lost his trial by combat. Oh, I'll get into his trial, by the way, later. He awaits in the dungeons of the Red Keep for his impending execution. His elder brother, Jaime, however, frees him, and they say their emotional goodbyes. Jamie says, go meet Varys and you can dip. Instead of meeting Varys, who was supposed to take Tyrion across the narrow sea to Essos, Tyrion takes a crossbow, and he goes to his father's chambers. But, he finds his ex-lover, Shay, in his father's bed, calling for Tywin. A struggle breaks out, where Tyrion has to kill his former lover, who spoke out against him at his trial. He kills her by choking her to death, though it pained him greatly before finding his father using the shitter. Him and his father talk, and he fired a couple shots being goaded by Tywin, and he watches his father slump against the wall behind him. Yeah, cause fuck Tywin. There were so many times we could have seen Tywin die. Like, Arya wasted like two names when one of them could have been Tywin, but we really got to see Tywin die here, and, and Tyrion wasn't playing no games. He said, S what, oh, she what? Say it again. He's like, oh, she's just a whore. He said, like, pop, I got the shooters on me, nigga. What you talk about? Bitch-ass Ramsey getting fed to his dogs. Manipulative and psychotic, the former bastard Ramsey Bolton made his on-screen debut while posing as a man sent to rescue Theon Greyjoy. Playing one of his many sick games, he freed Theon and then caught him and brought him back to Winterfell. He tortured Theon in many ways, but the cruelest was, um, where... You know, he cut out Theon's bacon and eggs and shit. What? 
No. Pork sausage. <laughs> you think I'm some sort of savage? <laughs> he sent them to Balin Greyjoy. He took everything away from Theon and forced him to go by the moniker of Reek, making him sleep in the kennel with the dogs. After being legitimized, he was betrothed and married to Sansa Stark to secure the North, but he turned abusive the night of their wedding where he forced Theon to watch him rape her. He beat and raped Sansa until her eventual escape in the last episode of season 5. He even went so far as to kill his father. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, never mind. His father was poisoned by their enemies. What a shame. After losing the Battle of the Bastards and getting his face beaten by Jon, he got chained up in the kennels. Sansa got her revenge, where she allowed his hounds to eat him alive while she watched. She said, yeah, get that shit again. I know some of y'all might not appreciate the fact that Ramsey's death is so high because you consider him Joffrey 2.0, but come on, seeing John punch that nigga in the face was so satisfying. He said, pop, pop. <laughs> he had it with the shield. He said, ha, ha, pop. All right. Joffrey's death. Tell me, tell me what other TV show can make you root for a 14 year old's death, man. Like, come on. That's, fuck Joffrey. Fuck this nigga. Petulant and cruel, the false king, Joffrey Baratheon, found great pleasure in taunting and abusing people. Oh shit, Joffrey. Okay, so in the beginning of book one of Game of Thrones, when they find the direwolves, there's a stag antler in the direwolf. Alright, so if Joffrey Baratheon, if we call him a Baratheon for only namesake, he's the stag that kills the direwolf. I'm slow. His first act of cruelty on screen was where he cut the butcher's boy's face until Arya stopped him. He threatened her and shouted obscenities at her until her direwolf in the mirror attacked him. His true nature, however, reared its ugly head when he was crowned King Joffrey Baratheon. The power having gone to his head, he executed Ned Stark on false charges of treason despite promising Sansa to grant him mercy. Bitch ass nigga. From then on, he continued to taunt and abuse Sansa Stark from forcing her to look at her father's decapitated head. Look at him. Please let me go home. I won't do any treason. I swear. I'll Mother just... says I'm still to marry you, so you'll stay here and obey. Look at him! To having the Kingsguard beat and humiliate her and threaten to rape her on her wedding night to his uncle Tyrion. During season four, on his wedding day, he taunted them by having the company of Dorth actors act out the War of the Five Kings. He laughed as Sansa was close to tears as the dwarfs mimicked her brother's death. The, the red wedding shit is fucked up. When he began to sputter and choke after the drink from the poison cup, his face purpled and you can see blood streaming from his orifices on his face. Oh, he died painfully. It was so satisfying. We got Lady Olena with the flex dropping hints that she killed this nigga. We get Joffrey choking. He, that's the, I never want to go that way. That's the worst way to go, and I went. I'm glad. Cersei was like, "Oh, it was so great," until everyone looked at Tyrion, and then I was like, "Oh, don't, don't, don't do that." Some honorable mentions have to be Lord Baelish's death. Watching that nigga get his shit cut open by Arya, and he was just like, "Sansa, please don't wait. If we get, if we can talk about it, I can, if we work it out, it's, I can move it from my savings." And she, Thank you for all your many lessons, Lord Baelish. I will never forget them. Um, both times Drogon was used was fucking so satisfying. We've been waiting 
all season to see these fucking dragons. And I'm not gonna lie, when the show uses the dragons, they are fucking weapons of mass destruction. It's great. <laughs> Dracarys. When the sept blows up, that was probably one of the most beautiful visions of TV I've seen. The music, the wordless narrative for 10 minutes, the explosion, the wildfire, the cockiness of the High Sparrow, the cockiness of Cersei, <sighs> Tommen, bro, oh, oh, dude, Lancel, nigga got gutted, and then he said, Oh, bro. So the most satisfying moment in Game of Thrones, in my opinion, has to be Tyrion's speech during his trial. Because one, Peter Dinklage is an amazing actor, but the things he says are just so so real and so visceral and it cuts and nigga. <laughs> Having been blamed wrongly for the murder of King Joffrey, his uncle Tyrion was made to stand trial for the crime. We really know that Olena Tyrell killed him, but they didn't know that. They blamed it on. And Sansa dipped with Baelish, so like she was Tyrion was really hung out to dry. Despite being given the opportunity to live and join the Night's Watch, Tyrion chose to make a confession after being prompted by Shay, his former lover, who told the court he and Sansa Stark, his wife whom she grew jealous of, planned to murder Joffrey. And it is kind of coincidental that maybe if he joined the Night's Watch, he would have ended up in Winterfell anyway, if he had survived the Battle of the Wall, that is. <laughs> that probably would have happened after he got there. He stood at the podium and confessed that, yes, he was guilty. No, not for the murder of King Joffrey, but for being a dwarf, which he stated the fact that he was on trial for it his whole life. In the books, he even says, all dwarves are bastards in their father's eyes. That's a trial in the family right there. Speaking of, as Tywin tries to send him away for causing commotion amongst the people, he demands a trial by combat as the House Lannister theme swells and he and Tywin stare at each other. Have you nothing to say in your defense? Nothing but this. I did not do it. I did not kill Joffrey, but I wish that I had. Watching your vicious bastard die gave me more relief than a thousand lying whores. I wish I was the monster you think I am. I wish I had enough poison for the whole pack of you. I would gladly give my life to watch you all swallow it. Samarin! Samarin! Escort the prisoner back to his cell. I will not give my life for Joffrey's murder, and I know I'll get no justice here, so I will let the gods decide my fate. I demand a trial by combat. Ending the episode, 
and we're not gonna talk about how my nigga, oh, dude, my uh, my nigga Oberon basically killed the mountain, but he got caught monologuing. I might talk about that later. Who gave you the order? Say her name. You raped her. You murdered her. You killed her children. Say it. Say her name. Say it. <laughs> Elia Martel. Ah! I killed her children. Then I raped her. Then I smashed her head in like this. Tyrion's time in prison was kind of sad too, because like everybody was leaving him. Braun was like, I can't help you. Jamie was like, I can't help you. And then Oberyn was like, I can help you. But then Oberyn, what the fuck, nigga? You said, say it. <laughs> he said, I said it, nigga. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know what some of your most satisfying moments were from Game of Thrones. In a way, I am really sad it's ending. So I will appreciate what we have now. Thanks for watching, guys. My name's Cliff, and this has been Unpack That Bowl. Peace. You're it. talking to a king! Ah! And now I've struck a king. Did my hand fall from my wrist? <laughs>